How does your RV roof look? Good, bad, or ugly? That's the question that only you can answer it by getting on a ladder and going up there and checking it out. And that's what we're going to be talking about today for staying on the road in the Smart RV or podcast. We're also going to talk about Cruise America and living the RV life. And then we're going to visit Sleeping Bear Dunes National Park. Say that 10 times fast. <laughs> And that's going to be in the next stop. And then we're going to wrap up the show with RV Envy. In this episode, we're going to talk about wire connectors, voltmeters, and a logic probe. You've probably never even heard of a logic probe, but we're going to talk about it today. This is Eric Stark with the Smart RVer podcast, delivering the smarts you need to enjoy the freedom of the RV lifestyle without the fear of breaking down. So today's episode is 130. And before we dig into it, I just have one thing I want to say. This could be like an Eric rant. So as many of you know, we bought an RV for our business a while back, and it's a marketing trailer. It's uh, 28 feet long, and it's got all this stuff on it that we not not necessarily sell. We sell it, but it's all products that we push, promote, talk about. You know, it's got, um, I mean, we just redid the axles. We're putting on RV defenders, which are pretty cool. They're, I'm going to have to get into that another episode coming up. We're going to actually have the owner of the company, but it protects your wheel wells from blowouts. Ferion cameras. I mean, you name it, we've put it on. If it's not on, it's going on. So we're going to you know, <laughs> pimp out this ride, as they might say, somewhere in the world. <laughs> but one thing that's really aggravating, and it goes back to new RVs, is we bought this RV new. And taking it all from the dealership, you know, the rear brakes or the brakes didn't feel like they worked properly on it. And I kind of, whatever, you know, worry about when we get home, parked it for the winter, took it out and used it, forgot about the brake issue. And the brake issue was still there. So the brakes pretty much didn't work, you know, or they partially worked. And so going down steep grades was getting kind of scary, a little rough on the brakes on the truck, pulling it, um, everything gets hot. And so I determined that the rear brakes weren't working on the trailer. Now, when I mentioned this to the dealer, Bish's RV in Idaho, they have many locations. They told me I was nuts. There's no way the trailer left there with a brake issue, that I was full of it. And that seems to be a trend with dealerships. Just talking to someone yesterday, the customer was told he's crazy. You're imagining that. Basically, that's what they did. Made me feel like I was imagining the problem. So after we got back from this trip and the brakes weren't working, I knew the rear brakes weren't working because when we got to our destination, the front brakes were smoking hot. The rear brakes were just, you know, room temperature, if you will. So they weren't working. And so when I got home, after digging into it, oh, by the way, this is a Heartland trailer, so they're responsible for this mess. Bishes just sells it and provides the lack of customer service and um, Heartland is the one who put this together. So it has a full body pan underneath it. So you have to, you know, peel that back and dig into it. And so tracing the wires, cause there's no power going to the rear axle, power to the front axle, no power to the rear axle. Well, lo and behold, what you, what I found underneath was really surprising. The wire that goes to the axle was never connected to the power that was coming from the front axle. No, oh, no. They neglected to hook up the rear brakes. So that's not only a safety issue, that's just really, really messing up at a level that unacceptable. So when you're buying a new RV, make sure, now I checked it out, everything thoroughly other than that. So I will take some blame for it not working or actually not catching it at the dealership. But Heartland completely screwed up when they built this trailer and didn't hook up the brakes. So it makes you wonder, what else, what other wires are lying in wait there that haven't been hooked up? You know, I heard of one the other day, it was just yesterday, a guy bought a brand new RV and the dealership, which is a local one here near us. I shouldn't say local, that might implicate someone that I wouldn't want to, but in <laughs> Montana, and they never even checked it out. And when he got it home and he hooked up water to it, water was leaking out from everywhere. None of the plumbing was hooked up. It was all laying in the belly pan, but none of it was attached to anything. Oh, no. <laughs> so what a disaster. I shouldn't say none of it was hooked. There's enough to where water was leaking everywhere, you know? So you've got to check out these RVs before you ever give them a dime or sign the contract. Make sure that everything's working because they're going to tell you it is and it's not. 
And the brakes are really annoying because it was such a simple thing, but yet they told me I was full of it. We tested them. We put on an ohm meter. We put on a volt meter before it ever leaves. And they lied through their teeth is what they did. So keep that in mind that they're not on your side when you're buying an RV. It's all about getting your money and that's it. Period. Mm -hmm. And if there's anybody at dealership that wants to argue about that, call me. I'd be glad to argue about it. (laughs) (laughs) Now that I've got my rant out of the way, and it's not just a rant, it's just letting you know that it's not always what it is when you're buying an RV. And I, I went nice there. I was, I was downplaying that. <laughs> and so Alexis, welcome to the show today. Thank you. <laughs> if you want to leave, you can. Now's the time. I enjoyed your rant. <laughs> Let's talk about living the RV life mm-hmm. and cruise America. Now, Cruise America is a rental brand that probably every RVer has seen on the road, even before oh, yeah. they became an RVer. Yep, I see it all the time. Especially in certain parts of the country. I think they're in Florida and Arizona. That's their two strongholds. Mm-hmm. So you really see them in those states or the, the states around them. Yeah. And I, I remember these things have been around forever. They have. You know? Yeah, they have. We're not going to try to sell you on renting an RV because you own an RV, right? right? Exactly. We're bringing out some points that maybe you haven't thought about, or if you're a new RV, some things to uh, to think about. Alexis, what can you tell us? What can you add to this at this point? Well, for one, like we were kind of discussing, if you are an RV owner already and you want to check out maybe a different model of an RV or... If you have a trailer and you said, like, you want to check out maybe, like, a Freightliner or a Mercedes or whatever type of, you know, RV, um, that you can do that. Also, I was thinking, too, if you have family in town and they're not RVers, you know, but you guys want to go on a camping trip, then get them set up with a, with a Cruise America RV. Right. What do you think, Eric? I think that's a great idea. And to elaborate a little bit on what you said about trying out a new RV, so an example would be if you had a travel trailer, and you wanted to get a motorhome, let's say a Class C, then you just rent one of their Class Cs. Yeah. And that gives you a good taste of it. You know, try to maybe look at some RVs before you ever rent one, find something that they have. Maybe it's not the same brand and all that, but the same style, you know, the overhang and so forth. Because there's going to be things that are going to catch you off guard if you just go buy one. You're going to get home sitting in the driveway going, oh, man. <laughs> yeah. I miss my old trailer, you know, mm-hmm. where's old blue, let's get her back. <laughs> right, exactly. So you, you don't want to find yourself that way. Uh, motorhomes are different because, you know, here and being around them for many years, you get into them and drive them and they just have a different feel. It's not like pulling a trailer. Yeah. I like pulling a trailer myself rather than driving a motorhome. Yeah. yeah. That's me. But Preference. There's pros and cons to it all. And Alexis brought out a great point too about family visiting or something like that you know even if you're because i was thinking about this the other day where we went to california for a quick trip and driving back i was thinking you know our family is so spread out and i have an rv they don't but we could meet someplace if they just rented an rv we could meet halfway yeah meet on the oregon coast or something and kind of turn into a fun trip Exactly. You know, or even if they flew to Oregon, they could rent an RV yeah. up there, you know? Yep, exactly. So there's some options there, you know? Yeah. Hey, you are. just need a spare room for a week or two. Someone's coming to visit you. You don't want them in the house. Honestly, <laughs> I mean, there you go. In our RV. It says Cruise America on it, but it's ours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's real. <laughs> so just throwing some things out there. Sometimes we, you know, forget about this. You know, we might think about like a... Uh, 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 renting a verbo or something or yeah. or different things but rv is cool or if you know you have friends you really wanted to get into the rv lifestyle yeah. you know maybe convince them to rent an rv and try it out exactly you know? exactly because it'd be different renting one versus tagging along with somebody yeah for, you know for sure then they can get a full taste of it and help <laughs> them out you know all right so now that's going to take us to living the rv life excuse me staying on the road <laughs> It's been a hectic day already. I was ready to not do this today and not. We got to do it. Running behind schedule like always. Poor Eric. (laughs) (laughs) So staying on the road. So it's time to inspect your RV's rubber roof. You know, and I say rubber roof because most RVs today have a rubber roof on them, but you might have a different type of roof. It might be a fiberglass. It might be a, a TPO. 
It might be an extreme roof. It might be a whatever roof. It might be a, a metal roof from an, if you have an older RV. It doesn't matter. A roof is a roof that needs to be checked out. Now, how you maintain it's going to vary. Our subject will focus mostly on maintaining a rubber roof or an EPDM as they're also called. We don't really have time to get into other things. And what usually works on an EPDM will work on just about everything. Yeah, I can safely say that. So Dicor has some great information and that's what we're basing it on because we like Dicor products. You know, when it's time to check your rubber roof, there's things you're going to want to look for, but you know, how often do you check it? Let's just start with that. Really, you should probably wash and plan on do maintenance three or four times a year. Two would be the bare minimum. But you want to get up there and inspect it because remember, the roof protects everything in the RV. You know, that's where the money's at. The money's not on the roof, it's in the RV. So that's what you want to protect. You don't want to have leaks ruining things, a ceiling, a wall, and sometimes leaks, if they're undetected for a while, can cause a whole lot of damage. Or if you don't do anything about it, the damage can be phenomenal. And once dry rot starts, it just keeps on going. It's like a cancer. Mm -hmm. So that inspection is very important. And, you know, not only inspect the outside of the roof, but go inside and look inside the RV. Look for water stains, water marks. Open up the cabinets and look inside there because you might have a leak in a cabinet that you don't really notice because you're opening it, grabbing something, shutting the door. But go in there and physically look for leaks. It takes a little bit of time, you know, but it's not going to be that much time. And while you're on the roof, how does it feel? Does it feel soft in any spots? Is there a problem brewing that you're not aware of? Is the roof or the rubber becoming uh, delaminated? Do you see little wrinkles in it or large wrinkles? Yeah, I don't know if you've ever seen that when you're driving down the road and you see an RV maybe coming at you or passing you and the, the roof is lifted up about four feet into the air because it's become delaminated. Well, that probably just started in one spot and just gradually pulled the rest of it up over time. Maybe one trip, two trips, three trips. And the owner of the RV might never even notice it. Uh -huh. they, no one tells them or they don't go up on the roof to see anything, mm -hmm. you know. And generally the fabric will wrink or the material will wrinkle up. Kind of like a bed that's not made very well. You can kind of tell, you know. So you want to inspect it for things like that. Uh -huh. And it might not be something that's an easy fix, but at least you're ahead of it. Yeah. You know, rather than going down the road and the whole roof just blows off, you know, the rubber portion. Exactly. Yeah, got nothing but plywood, which that would really suck if it rained. Yeah. So look for things that are obvious, you know, and while you're up there, not only look to see if there's any seals around your vents, um, you know, if you have a rack, the stanchions on a ladder, you know, uh, plumbing vents to see if the sealants broke there. But in, just inspect it for everything. Make sure your vent lids aren't broken. If you have an air conditioner, well, not if. If the, you see if the air conditioner shroud is cracked, maybe do some air conditioner maintenance before you ever start cleaning the roof and going down that road. So it's getting ahead of it, you know. And from the roof, you can kind of see down on your clearance lights too, see if they're falling apart, see if they need to be resealed. So take advantage of being up there and plan on doing some work while you're there. Yeah. More than likely, it'll need it. Now, if you're on the regular maintenance schedule and you're doing it three or four times a year, you're probably not going to be actually doing repairs three or four times a year, at least not to the physical roof itself. You know, probably once a year we'll work on that. You know, but that's why you get up there and inspect it, just to make sure to get ahead of any crack seals so they don't start leaking. And when you're when we're talking about a rubber roof, you can't just use anything you want on it. You have to be cautious of the cleaners. Anything generally with petroleum in it is going to be bad for a rubber roof. It's going to cause it to disfigure, kind of bubble up. Remember in the early days of our rubber roofs, you know, shops didn't know any better and they get up there the things they always used and, well, they'd cause problems, you know. Might not ruin the roof, but it sure make it ugly in spots. That's That's for sure. So you want to be careful with that. And I just say you use what's recommended by Dicor and other manufacturers who make things specifically to clean a rubber roof. And the reason why is they have special cleaners in them called surfactants that will bring out the dirt, open up the pores, and it makes it a much better cleaning job. Whereas something like if you don't have that, you could use Dawn dishwashing uh, detergent or liquid 
because it's pretty safe and it's very versatile. And so you could use that as well. But I recommend using what Dicor makes or any company like Camco or Thetford. They also make rubber roof cleaners, best products. There's a lot out there. But make sure it's made for cleaning a rubber roof. Now, also when you're using cleaners of any kind on the roof, you have to remember that all that water is going to run down the side of the RV. Now, Dicor recommends that you mask off or, or plastic off the side of the RV. So you wrap it with plastic on the side. So any water will run down on the plastic and not the side of the RV. And that's going to be your call. The plastic certainly makes it harder to do, but you have to make sure if you don't use the plastic to to see to it that the side of the RV is wet at all times. So it might take another person helping you to keep the side of the RV wet as you're cleaning the roof. And basically they're going to be hosing off or, or helping to hose off anything that's running down the sides because I have seen it discolor awnings. It will discolor paint. Even just a cleaner will do that. It will take any dirt out of the side of the RV and you have a very bright spot there. Take the waxes off. So you have to be cautious. Dicor is going to recommend the most fail-safe way of doing it because, well, their name's on it and they have to be cautious that way. But that's going to be your call. But just make sure that you're not just hosing off the roof and forgetting about the sidewalls. Otherwise, you will regret that. Keep everything nice and wet at the bare minimum. And now sometimes a roof might have tough stains on it. And, you know, you can get really carried away trying to clean them. But I wouldn't worry too much about that. I think you, if you get too carried away, you're going to do more damage than you are good. For example, if you have um, uh, mold and mildew or grown on the roof or mold, and you know you scrub it off and it leaves these black stains, well, the black stains probably aren't going to hurt anything. It's more of a visual. And really, who cares unless you're in a high-speed chase and that helicopter's coming in from behind and they, oh, look at his roof. <laughs> How rude. No. I doubt that's going to happen either, but you never know this day and age, anything could happen. (laughs) So if you really feel like you got to get the mold off the roof, you have to use scrubbed it and just leaves a stain. You could use something like Tylex on it, but be cautious. You know, you want to just clean it to the bare minimum. Don't get carried away and sit there and scrub the roof and spraying on more, you know, scrub and spraying on more. It's, it'll only damage the roof at a certain point it's not going to clean it and certain berries might leave stains my take on it is get as clean as you can without going crazy i wouldn't even use the tilex use their normal cleaner who cares you can't see the roof and it's not going to hurt a thing it's just a stain it's not going to damage anything it's not going to shorten the life of it now sometimes you might get tree sap on a roof now that gets a little trickier and That's one you probably want to just avoid to ever happen so you don't find yourself having to clean it. But one thing you can do is put ice on the sap, on the drops, depending on how many there are, and the ice will freeze the sap, and sometimes you can just peel it up that way. So that makes it real nice, but that could be time-consuming as well, depending on how much sap is on the roof. Or you can use mineral spirits. But you have to be very cautious with mineral spirits because they're not really what should be used on a rubber roof. But if you put it on a, a rub or on a towel and not on the roof, you put it on the towel and then try to clean it off, you could do that. If I were going to do that, I'd try to get off as much of the sap as possible before I did that. That would almost be like a final cleanup. You know, you right. try to scrape it off and a little bit is left and the mineral spirits will get the rest off. And, you know, sap, once it dries, sometimes might be easier to clean, but it might be harder. It's kind of a double-edged sword there. But the best thing to do is avoid trees where there's going to be sap coming out or they have nasty berries in them. Mm -hmm. And I know sometimes you're out camping where you want the trees because it provides shade. So that's something you have to figure out. (laughs) You know, if you're going to be there for a while, maybe you could get a tarp, you know, it sounds kind of ghetto, throw it up on the roof, cut a hole for the air conditioner and, you know, and do what you got to do. (laughs) But the main thing is to be cautious when you're cleaning it. Rubber roofs are very durable, but at the same time, they can be kind of fragile. Like so many other things on an RV, like an awning fabric, durable when they're on on the awning, but when they're on the ground, they're very fragile, easy to tear and cut. Now, when you're Cleaning your RV roof, it might seem like a daunting task. You know, it's eight feet wide, 30 feet long, 40 feet long. 
mm-hmm. 28 feet long, whatever. It's, it's a lot of space. Well, don't look at it at the whole roof. Just look at a section, you know, break it up into little squares, if you will. So that way you're focused on one area. So lay out a, you know, mental grid on the RV. Like, you know, you have the back of the RV aside and maybe there's a plumbing vent that's about four feet from the back. So you come over to the plumbing vent and then maybe go down the middle. So you actually might be working on a four by four foot area. And then, you know, the piece next to it would be the same size or close to it. So work in a grid pattern, it'll mentally be easier to do. And then it also helps you keep track of where you've been. It's going to make more sense. You know, like if you had to stop and you get back on the roof an hour later, you know where you stopped at. But when you're cleaning a roof, you probably want to just get all, you know, get it all done at the same time, not take breaks because you got that water going, you got cleaners going down the side. For me, it's plan on washing the RV at the same time. So don't do the sides first, do those last. Obviously. You know, everything you did will be undone. <laughs> and when it comes to just cleaning the rubber roof, like I said, use, I I recommend using what the manufacturers make, like Dicor. Any product Dicor makes, we're behind it because they make good products. They, they know rubber roofs inside and out. They've been making them for decades. They do a great job with it, so their products work really well. And that's what we sell in our store. We sell some other brands, but Dicor is our main product. And that's the one we push. So if you keep it going in a grid pattern, even washing it, not just getting down the nitty-gritty stuff, but just washing it, it's going to make it easier. So work towards the back, let's say. You know, do the left rear corner, the right rear corner, then the next section, then the next section, and keep going forward. And then when you're all done, there shouldn't be any soapy, dirty water behind you. You've been hosing it off as you go. Then the person that's helping you or you're doing it spraying down the side as you go as well. Mm -hmm. So it makes it a lot easier that way, and it doesn't make it so daunting. Remember, after you get done cleaning it, I should have said this earlier, if you're going to do any repairs on your vents, so say the sealant is cracked, the lap sealant, you want to do that after you clean the roof. So you get that roof, th- well, actually, you know, there's, Dicor says to do all that stuff a couple of weeks in advance, get all your repairs done, like lap sealant, and the thing about it, it makes sense, because that gives it time to dry, because after you wash the roof, and I might have confused this here, but after you wash the roof, the pores are still open. And so the roof is going to dry and you're going to have to help it blow off some areas around the vents and things, get a towel or a squeegee or something, speed it along so it's thoroughly dry. That way when you put on your um, uh, any kind of roof coating, if you're going to do that, mm-hmm. which Dicor doesn't recommend doing that for a long time down the road, mm-hmm. or if you're going to use any UV protectant, it'll soak into the pores. So you want to do your major repairs first, but if you're not going to do a roof coating, you could do your minor repairs after it's washed. And most often you're not going to do a major repair, like do a roof coating until you absolutely have to, to where the black is showing through on the rubber roof. The roofs have a, you know, 15 year, 14 year warranty, and they'll go longer than that if you do maintenance. And then when the, finally that black starts showing through, you want to do a roof coating. Unless you're just dead set on doing a roof coating. Maybe your roof has gotten so ugly you just can't take it anymore and you're afraid that if someone sees it in a helicopter or a semi, they're going to laugh at you. <laughs> then you coat the roof and it'll look nice and pretty when it's all new. Now, keep in mind, coating a roof when it's not done right just creates a whole another set of maintenance issues. So you want to make sure you coat the roof properly according to the manufacturer specifications of whatever brand roof coating you use and make sure that roof is dry, that there's no water anywhere. So those are things to keep in mind. And roof coatings, you know, there's a lot of brands out there. Dicor makes one. Um, Hangs Elixir makes one. There's other companies that do. You know, it depends on what you're really trying to accomplish there. Are you trying to seal it so there's no more leaks? And a lot of these roof coatings won't work that way. They just coat the roof, make it pretty, and keep the sun off the rubber but they're not designed to cure all the leaks forever. And I'm not saying there aren't roof coatings that do that because there are, but those are more of a system, a roof coating system that become more complex and a little more spendy. But they do work when you find the right company and there's companies that do it. You know, you can do it yourself. You just have to make sure they sell or have the instructions for you to do it and kind of help you along the way with everything you'll need to know. But in most cases, you can go 
at least 15 to 20 years without having to worry about coating a roof. Just do the maintenance. Mm -hmm. And after it's all washed and clean, you put on the roof guard or the UV guard to protect that rubber. And if you do it three or four times a year, that roof's going to just keep lasting. And there's no reason not to because you got to inspect it. And to really do your maintenance properly, you got to wash it. So you might as well do the UV guard as well. Sometimes you get black streaks on the side of your RV and there are black streak removers for that. That's just from the soot and different things on the roof that runs down the side. You know, there's a million black streak remover type products out there. So your local RV store will have those. So not a worry. So I think we've covered it. I've covered this before in a previous podcast. Maintaining that roof is so important. It's just something we have to do. Let's just jump on to a whole other subject here and talk about the next stop. Yes. So Alexis, wake up. I'm awake, sort of. <laughs> All right. So now, oh, wake up and look at Sleeping Bear Dunes National Park. Yeah, wow. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So Alexis, how come we're going to... Sleeping Bear Dunes National Park. Well, I think this place is super unique. It's on the you know, the eastern coastline of Lake Michigan. And just looking at it, I mean, obviously, you know how big Lake Michigan is, but it just looks like an ocean. So if you want the ocean experience and you don't have to drive, you know, all the way to the ocean, if you live inland pretty far, then go here because it is so, so cool. Just do a Google search and look at the pictures. It's beautiful. And there's a lot to do there. There's lighthouses. There's really, really cool antique stores. Obviously, there's a lot of camping you can do. There's just uh, neat museums in the area and, and so much more. But it's just a beautiful place. You could even go for the day. Just go swimming. Yeah, it's a good idea. Those lakes are huge. does bring a whole new effect to things. Um, Super cool. Yeah, and, you know, sometimes people live near those places places and like i've done it everybody does it and you don't really enjoy it you, I know. you take advantage of what's right there you know you do and sometimes maybe where you're at or where you might go might not be the best place and you think ah, the whole lake's got to be that way Mm-mm. so well. <laughs> sometimes we have to get out and explore maybe without the rv go on a day trip or something and or a weekend trip do some exploration yeah why not it's find really cool. cool places yeah yeah and so, of course, there's uh, things to do there, right? Oh, yeah. Like I said, we've, you've got antique stores. That's always, you know, somebody's interest to go there, find something unique. Um, they've got museums. They've even got a lighthouse, the North Manitou Island Lighthouse. So if you're into that, you got to go check it out. <laughs> yeah, lighthouses are pretty cool. It's yeah. a pretty good hobby these days. Mm-hmm. It seems like they're disappearing more and more, but there's still a lot out there. Yeah. Yeah, so there's things to do there, and that's what's important. And then, of course, there's places to eat, like always. Always. <laughs> All right. So there's the, I can't even remember. I know. That. I was going to try to go for it. Trattoria Funestrada. There we go. <laughs> <I'm> Italian. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And then we got the Red Door uh, Coffee House and a good Harbor Grill. So just some nice right. options. So always food. Now, what about for RV? Is there, is there a place for RVers to stay there? You know it. Um, there's a couple. Yeah. Indigo Bluffs RV Park. It's right next to the lake. The Lake Lilanu <laughs> RV Park. <laughs> and then Frankfurt Crystal Lake RV. And that's just a few. There's so many more. Just to mention a few. Yeah. So we always bring out the things to whet your appetite. That's what we say every episode. And so hopefully there's some things here that'll whet your appetite. So you got the Great Lakes. Michigan Lake is one of them. Mm -hmm. And so you want to enjoy that. Get up there, um, especially if you're not from the area. You know, it's really quite a sight to see. It is. Yeah. A lot of things in the United States that are just amazing to see. They're really cool. You know, a lot of people like to go abroad, but there's so much here. I mean, it's different than Europe and other places, but it's just unique here. Yeah, yeah. And the the rich American history, the cultures you find, the vast variety of cultures as well. Mm -hmm. So the United States is a pretty cool country to check out. So this is just one little sliver of it. That's right. So we're bringing you the world a sliver at a time. (laughs) And also, don't forget to look at RV Destinations Magazine. We always recommend that magazine or we have been um 
it's such a great magazine and where you subscribe to it. A lot of good information there. We sometimes will incorporate it in the show. We haven't really gotten into the full groove of it yet, and we've got permission from them to do it. We're just, you know, we're just us. <laughs> <laughs> but we will. But in the meantime, if you guys go to rvdestinationsmagazine.com, you can check it out for yourself. And I recommend subscribing. It's a fantastic magazine. All right, now that's going to bring us to RV Envy. And today we're going to talk about, I said wire connectors, voltmeter, and logic pro, but really it's, you know, wire connectors are pretty straightforward. It's just using the right ones when you're dealing with uh, 12 volts or 110 volts. I mean, mostly it's 12 volts on an RV. You know, don't use electrical tape to make connections. Use the right size crimp connectors. Make sure they're right for the job crimp them properly if they're going to be outside you might want to use ones with uh, heat shrink on them or put heat shrink on them either way or tape them up really good if you don't want to do that but make sure they are crimped on and they're crimped properly a lot of connectors today you can get with uh, a solder already in them with the heat shrink so you crimp it hit it with heat and it'll melt the solder and do the heat shrink at the same time but more importantly, using a voltmeter to check for electrical problems is the most important thing because so often everybody has electrical problems. They come in the store and they haven't checked out anything. They wanted to start buying parts. It's not how it works. You got to check it out because quite often the part they want to buy is not the part that's bad because a little testing will go a long way and use a voltmeter. Test lights are okay, but voltmeters are much better. They tell you a lot more than a test light ever will. And then finally, the logic probe. Now, logic probes come in different flavors. You know, there are ones with just, they look like a test light with a coil lead on it. And then there's ones that look more like a uh, electrical tester for like 110 volts where you hook up power to it. Whatever your flavor is, Harbor Freight sells one for like 15, 20 bucks. It's uh, pretty simple to use. But what's cool about a logic probe is, let me get to the point here. Let's say you pull out a panel on your RV and it has all these switches on it. And maybe you're looking for the one for the awning because the awning's not working. And you want to test to make sure that the switch is working properly and you have power there. If some of the wires were to pull off the switch, you might not know which ones went where, what they are. And some switches will have ground wires going to them. They have an internal ground, which is okay. It works. So with a logic probe, when you uh, use it properly, they all come with instructions. It'll tell you which wire is positive and which wire is negative. So you can't confuse them. And a lot of times in an RV, the wires aren't marked. And you know, they might be all white coming into a panel. Uh -huh. Maybe some will have a purple stripe, an orange stripe, but it doesn't mean they're positive or negatives, you know. So a logic probe will help you sort through that. You can do it without a logic probe, but it's easier with a logic probe, especially um, if you're inexperienced. It'll make it much easier. So use the voltmeters, use the right connectors, and get yourself a logic probe. Even if it's just a cheapy one from Harbor Freight and you got it, it's there. And then you can do it. For more information on this podcast, you can go to the website, SmartRVer, thesmartrver.com. I was looking at something else as I said that. We have so many websites, and I actually skipped over some things to do today, but we're all right. So you can go to the website and check out everything we talked about today. It will be there as always. So this is Eric Stark, and I want to thank you for hanging out with us today on the Smart RVer podcast. So if we don't see you on the road, we'll just connect at smartrver.com.